do your will in this service, Lord. It should be the song service, your little rock, Lord, you might be these things for us. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. <coughs> Number 65, we have come into this house. <coughs> Yeah. 
community, so perhaps uh, some of you would like to get a little here. Um, but anyway, then we'll be flying up the next day. So keep us in prayer. Uh, meetings are set. Uh, we've got to fly from uh, U.S. to Belgium, from Belgium to Turkey. And I have a short stay over Turkey, and then from Turkey down to uh, Canada. Not the sweetest places in the world to be. So I uh, just pray that uh, we'll be in God's hands and uh, we'll be in perfect will. So, uh, Brother Adam, you take this request before the Lord this time. I'm kind of in the Father, I hope for your love and forgiveness to us. Lord, we thank of our brothers and sisters who are traveling. And the Lord taking the patience and then go to rest. We pray, Lord, that you keep them safe. We thank you, Josh and Alicia and John and Lisa. New York, keep them safe, Lord. Let them be able to fellowship with each other, Lord, and for some rest. We thank you for their glad and uh, love us for the gym and then traveling up there in Alaska. Watch over them, keep them safe. Lord, those that couldn't be here, Lord, we pray to keep them safe. Far away, Lord, for keep them safe also. Yes. <coughs> Lord, you're so good to us, Lord. Watch over this little swamp, we pray for you. The sick and afflicted, Lord, those that need your help. And Lord, we thank you, Brother Brian, Brother Don, on them traveling to minister your gospel, Lord. To see how the apostles went traveling around the world, Lord, to teach your gospel. We pray, Lord, you help Brother Brian. Keep them safe, Lord, and wherever they go, they be a good testimony of your word. Be with us, we pray, Father, and ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Give me. Give me. Let's all stand to our feet, I guess.
when he, he would come. And he said, it's not even, even the Son himself don't know when it's going to happen. See, God, uh, God has this all to himself. It's a secret. And that's the reason there was silence in heaven for a space of a, of a half hour. And seven thunders uttered their voice, and John was even forbidden to write it. See, the coming of the Lord. That's one thing he doesn't reveal yet of how he will come and when he will come. It's a good thing that he doesn't. No, he has showed or revealed it in every type that's in the Bible, 58. Therefore, the entire Bible is the revelation of God's mystery in Christ. Huh? The entire Bible is an expression of one goal that God had one purpose that he wanted to achieve in the entire Bible, and all the acts of the believers in the Bible has been in a type and expressing what God's great goal is. And now in this last day, he has revealed it and shows it. And, and, and God's help, we'll see it right here this morning, what the Lord has had in his mind all along and has expressed it. Therefore, you can see the great meaning of what it's been to know this, and then try to bring it to the people, see? And then you don't, and, and I don't, and I haven't went into details and tried to explain it as God has revealed it to me. So, Brother Graham hasn't even got there yet. And this is paragraph 58. But he's just going to start getting into revealing what this great mystery is about. And uh, I just want to go back now then to some thoughts that said, now remember, Brother Graham had just spoken concerning what Paul said in Colossians 2.15, where he said, who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. And we found on Sunday that uh, Hebrews 1 and 3 tells us the very same thing. Paul expressed the very same thoughts here. He said, Who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. And we also, we also, as sons, are predestined to be conformed to the image of the firstborn son, as Romans 8.29. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. And again, we see this predestinated promise of God in 1 Corinthians 15, 49. And as we have been born the image of the earthly, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly. So as we have born this image, you see, this is an image, right? As we have born the image of the earthly, we shall also bear another image, the image of the heavenly. Now, we're going to look at what that image is, because too many people, and as I said Sunday, you know, back in the 70s, the, the Jesus people... And you might remember that, Cindy, the, the, the Jesus, they call them the Jesus freaks, but you know, the Jesus people, the flower children, this kind of thing. And they all walked around with beards, and it was coming out of the hippie days. They had beards and long hair, and, and they tried to look like uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and uh, old Jesus, you know, and, and they wore sandals, and they wore their own tunics, and, and, uh, and, and they're trying to be in the image of Christ. But that is not the image of Christ. Brother Brown said that if Jesus came in this hour with nail scars in his hand, I wouldn't believe it. So there's a different image that we're looking at. Something that's not, it's not. This image is the is the image of the invisible. So then this image is invisible. You understand? Now, <clears throat> but it can't be seen. And we're going to look at how it can be seen. Alright? Now, to totally remove from our mind that this image of God has to do with our physical looks or to the physical form that we have, let's listen to what God's vindicated prophet, Dwayne Brown, had to say about this image of God in Genesis 1.26. So from questions and answers on Genesis, Brother Brown said, well now, if you'll notice close now, in Genesis 1.26, he said, uh, well let's get that first part. God said, let us make man in our image. No, in our image. Of course, we realize he's talking to someone. He was speaking to another being, let us make man in our own image, after our own likeness, and let them have dominion over the cattle of the field. If you notice in creation, the first thing that was created, of course, was light. You come down, on down through the creation, and the last thing was created was what? Was man. And woman was made after man. Alright? And the first, last thing that was created of God's creation is mankind. But when God made his first man, if you notice, he made him in the likeness of himself. He was made in the image of God. And what is God? Now, if, if, if we can find out what God is, we can find out what kind of man that he made. So now, St. John, the fourth chapter, 23rd, 24th verse. Alright? Jesus says, you worship me. That's it. You worship what you know not. We know what we worship for salvation is of the Jews. And that's right, see? But the hour cometh, and now is, that the true worshiper, Jew or Gentile, shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh us to worship him. Now, the next verse is where I want to get. God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. So this image, now, that we're starting to hold into, this image is not something physical. It's something that is expressed so that you can see it, but it is not a physical 
its attributes, its characteristics. All right? Now, if God created man in his own image and in his own likeness, what kind of a man did he create? A spirit man. Now, if you'll notice, notice, after he had made all the creation and created a spirit man, and the close, the close reading of this now to the one that has asked the question, we'll find this, that God gave dominion of the cattle and the fishes and everything to, to the man. But in his makeup, or, or in his making up there, he, he made man in his own image to lead the cattle, lead the beasts of the field, just like the Holy Spirit leads the believer today. See, so we're looking at the Holy Spirit as a spirit, right? Well, man was in a, it was in a spirit form. Therefore, man in that leadership role, it wasn't it had nothing to do with the physical flesh. It had all to do with these attributes and characteristics that, that made up that spirit. Now, if, okay, um, he was, in other words, Adam, the first man in the lower creations of God, the first creation with God himself. Now, I know Brother Brown doesn't mean that God created himself. You see, what Brother Brown is saying here is, is God, he's not saying God created God here. Because what he said earlier is that God made the angels first to worship him. Then he, Elohim, the self-existent one, could receive worship, thus making him God, for God is an object of worship. So what he's saying was God wasn't even God as far as an object of worship until there was somebody to worship him. All right? Then he says, out of God came the Logos, which was the Son of God. Then out of the Logos, which was the Word, at the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word has made flesh and dwelt among us. Out of the Logos came forth the man. Now, this is where uh, some get confused here because they believe John 1 and 1, the Logos, was Jesus the man and not God. But what Brother Brown is telling us here is that Jesus, the firstborn son, had to be the same substance as the Father. So if the Logos came out of God and brought forth a son, then God is Logos, has to be Logos in order for his son to be Logos. And out of the Logos came Logos. Now, I hope that's not too difficult to understand. I mean, human come out of human. Dogs and cats don't come out of human. Unless you're some kind of a freak. And somebody implanted those things in there. <clears throat> because it just doesn't happen. Every seed after its kind. And so if, 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 the, if the seed giver is Logos, then the seed that comes out of, out of that Logos has got to be Logos. All right, from questions and answers, Connor and Brother God, Brother God said, God the Father, the Logos that was over Israel, he was holy, he could not bear sin. There had to be blood offering right and even. Then that Logos became flesh and dwelt among us, and, and, and where this Logos dwelt in a human body, which was a sacrifice. So that Logos came into a human body. All right, so that Logos, he's talking about that was up over Israel, he said that was the Father. He said, God the Father, the Logos, that was up over Israel. All right, from the message life, Brother Branham said, oh, excuse me, from the message seed shall not be heir with a shut, Brother Branham said, his father was the great Logos itself. All right, that's John 1 1. All right, now, from the message life, Brother Branham goes on to let us know how that, how the, then that that which came out of the Logos had to be Logos, and that was the Son of God. All right, he says, uh, let's close our eyes to our imagination for a few moments and go way back before there was anything. The great fountain of all eternity was that spirit of love, joy, that spirit of honesty, that spirit of trueness in his perfection. And then out of the existence of the Father went the Logos, which was the Son, which was the Theophany, which was the body of the great Jehovah God, went forth in a celestial body, that's the Logos, the Word spoke out of them great fountains of life and went forth, and there was the Theophany, which was God made into Word. Now, don't get confused here, because what we're dealing about is God's life. And so the, God, the, the life that was in God, by one spirit, were all baptized into one body. That life came out of God and brought forth Son. That Son had to be Logos. Because, now, now, let me just make this real simple. Jesus said, my words, my Logos, is spirit, and it is life. Right? So that life that came forth from the Father was Logos. It was word, it was spirit, it was life brought forth a son. All right? Now, and from the message, obey the voice of the angel, for the rest of the Logos that came out of God was the Son of God. So that should clarify that. So so we've seen Brother Ram saying the Logos was the Father. Now we said the Logos was the Son that came out of the Father. It has to be. I mean, I have three daughters and they're all human because I'm human. Right? I wouldn't expect, you know, have uh, poodles or, or cats for children. You are what you are. Every seed after his kind. So we see thus far that the Logos is God. Then his son Jesus would also have to be Logos. 
then if that's so, then God's other sons would also have to be Logos. And this is where Brother Branham is beginning to turn us in that direction to understand this in the message Christ is the mystery of God revealed. Paul said in Romans 8, in fact, uh, from impersonation of Christianity, Brother Branham said, His spirit, part of the Logos, he knew controlling your emotions. And Paul said in Romans 8 and verse 11, But if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his spirit which dwelleth in you. Okay, so we're looking then at the fact that God's spirit is living in your body, his life is living in your body, that's Logos, and that's in you. Now, what does that mean? It means that the spirit, he said, my words are spirit, they are truth. So if his word is abiding in you, then his spirit, his word, his Logos is abiding in you. In 1 Corinthians 12 and verse 13, Paul said, about four by one spirit, we are all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentile, whether we be bond or free, and have all been made to drink into one spirit. And from Ephesians 2.18, he said, For through him we both have access by one spirit unto the Father. Now I'm getting back to Brother Brandt's thoughts from questions and answers on Genesis. Brother Brandt said, Oh, I've got a beautiful picture in my mind here. Now, if you can take a, a little trip with me, I believe I've talked on it before, but to get this to the place where you'll be sure to see it. Now, let's take a little trip and go back for a little a while. Now, don't think about how hot it is. Get, let's get your minds right on what we're, we're going to talk about and think now. Let's go back a hundred million years before there ever was a star, moon, or anything in the world. Now, there was a time when there wasn't nothing here. It was just all forever and eternity. And all forever and eternity was God. He was, he was there in the beginning. Now, let's go, let's go out here on the edge of, the, of, of this banister and let's, let's look over and see these things that are happening. Now, no man has seen the Father at any time. No man can see God in bodily form because God is not in bodily form. God is a spirit. See? All right? No man has seen the Father, but the only begotten of the Son hath declared him. That means he's exegeted. He's spoken from his lips. And he's manifested through his being. All right? Uh, first John, see, but now, but now notice there's there's nothing. There's just space. There's no light. There's no dark. There's no nothing. It just seems nothing. But in there was a great supernatural being, Jehovah God, who covered all space of all places at all times. He was from everlasting, from everlasting. He is the beginning of creation. That's God. Can't see nothing. Can't hear nothing. Not a move of, of, of an atom in the air. Not 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 nothing. Not no air. No nothing. But yet God was there. That was God. Now, let's watch for a few minutes, and after a while, no man has seen that. Now, that's the Father, that's God the Father. Now, notice then, after a while, I begin to see a little sacred light begin to form, a little like a halo or something. You can only see it by supernatural or by spiritual eyes. Now, look now, while we're looking, the whole church now, we're standing on a great big banister watching what God's doing, and we'll get right down to this question here, and you'll see how He brings it in. Now, no one has seen God, and now the next thing we begin to see by eyes of supernatural looking, we see a little white light forming out there. What is that? That was called by the Bible readers, Logos, or the anointed, or the anointing. Now remember, where did that anointed or anointing, anointing come from? The anointer. So the anointer is Logos, God. The anointing is Logos. Okay, and the anointed, anointed, excuse me, is also, all right. Okay, so he says, now, no one has seen God. Now, the next thing we begin to see by eyes, the supernatural look, we see a little white light forming out there. What is that? We call, the Bible calls it the Logos, or anointing, or anointed. And the part of God began to develop into something, so human beings could have some type of an idea of what it was. Or a, a little light moving, he was the Word of God. Now, God gave himself birth to this son which was before there ever was an Adam, or heir to make an Adam. And that was, see, Jesus said, Glorify me, Father, with the glory that we had before the foundation of the world. See, way back yonder, now in St. John 1, he said, In the beginning was the Word, and the first, and the, and the Word was God. And the Word was made flesh and walk among us, God unfolding himself down to human being. Now watch how he did it. Now he's not saying God made, him, made, made, made himself into a human being. He's saying God made a human being and came into it. There's a difference. Now, back there then, uh, when this little halo came, now we can't see nothing yet, but just by eyes of just supernatural, we see a halo standing there. Now that's the Son of God, the Logos. 
Now, I can see him playing around like a child, little child before the father's door with all eternity, see? And now, then, in his imaginary makeup, he begins to think of what things would be, and I can hear him say, let there be light. And when he did, and Adam burst into the sun from into existence, she whirled and, uh, for hundreds and millions of years, forming clippers and burning and, and forming like, a, like it is today, still burning, still breaking out. Okay? Now, from the message, words that I do shall bear witness of me, Brother Graham said, now I want to speak to you just a moment, or, or just to bring your attention to a few words here that Jesus said. He said, the works that I do, excuse me, the works that I do bear witness of me. The things that I do, that I say is what bears record of me. And that's what bears record of every person. Now remember, we're talking about the image of the invisible. And we're not talking about a physical image. We're talking about an image of an invisible. And so we need to know what makes up that invisible in order to understand what this image is. And so Brother Brown is letting us know here because, you see, if it's an image, it is something that's visual. You can, you know, you can, you can detect it with the eyes. But not per se a physical form. You understand Although Jesus in the physical form was everything that, that, that was an expression of God, Brother Branson, he was God's opinion expressed to, to, to the world. <clears throat> but notice, it's what makes up God. You see, God is love, God is mercy, God is grace, God is compassion, God, God is the Father, God is the healer, God is the Savior, God is all these wonderful redemptive properties. You see? So you're looking then at these are the attributes, and when those attributes are expressed, now you can see the word of life. All right? So, Brother Brown says, now that, uh, and that's what bears record of every person. Do you know, I, I'd rather you live me a sermon than preach me one. It'd be better evidence that you're a Christian. Isn't that right? Uh, live a sermon. And what we are here is what we live, what we do, our actions show what we are. And if we say that we have faith and then are afraid to step out and claim our faith and put it to work, then our faith doesn't do much, us much good, does it? The Bible says that faith without works is dead, just as the body without the spirit is dead. All right? And from faith once delivered to the saints, Brother Brown said, the spirit that was in you controls you. And if the spirit of Christ is in us, the body of Christ will be Christ-like. In its feelings, in its actions, whatever it is, it will be Christ-like. It will do the works of Christ. God wants to work in the body of Christ as he did in the physical, corporal body of the Lord Jesus. He wants to work in this body of Christ. And if he can only get them to the place where they'll let st stand still long enough that he can place them on the foundation of his word so he can work. God cannot work contrary to his word. So if God used the body in his son, then God must use the body of his sons. If, he's going, if his son was an expressed image of God and we are to be conformed to that image, then God has got to use your body to bring forth that image, to bring forth that expression. Now sitting on a law doesn't express God. Unless God specifically told you to sit on that law. When he, when he told the prophet, lay on your side for 340 days. That was an expression. I don't know exactly what expression it was, but it was patience, I'm sure. That was one of them. All right. Therefore, as we progress further into the study of Christ, is the mystery of God revealed, and further into our mini-series on the image of the, uh, of the invisible God, we must lay aside all thoughts as to the physical appearance and focus, our, uh, focus specifically on the attributes and characteristics which makes up Christ. And thus, Christian, because the word Christian means Christ's life. Which makes up the spiritual image of the Father. That he is innately and intrinsically is what we are to become, even as Jesus had to become in the very image of God. Now, in 1 John 4 and verse 15, Whosoever shall confess that Jesus is the Son of God, God dwelleth in him, and he in God. So, if God is dwelling in us, then where are the attributes? Where are, the, where are the actions, where are the attributes of love and joy and peace, long-suffering, gentleness and patience and meekness? Where are these things? You see? Now notice the promise is that if we make this right confession, if we say what God himself says concerning his Son, then God himself will come into us and will dwell in us. Now this takes us to John chapter 17, where we find Jesus praying in the garden before he is taken to finish the work that he was sent to do on the cross. In John chapter 17, verse 1, if you open your Bibles with me. 
these words spake Jesus and lifted up his eyes to heaven, and he said, Father, the hour is come, glorify thy Son, that thy Son may also glorify thee. Now, if Jesus and God were one like your fingers one, then this prayer is pretty ridiculous, because why would he ask for something he already had? And why would he ask to begin with? Why, why ask if you already have what you're asking for? And why would you ask if you're talking to yourself? But he goes on to say, As thou hast given him power over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. And this is life eternal, that, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. Now remember that word know is gnosko. And it means to know in an experiential way. In other words, it's a relationship. Now, if Jesus is declaring here that God has given him power, then he did not have it before God gave it to him. And notice here that, that he shows us what eternal life is, to know God and to know his Son. He says, I have glorified thee on the earth, I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. Again, the word glorified is endoxazo. I have expressed your opinions, I have expressed your values, I have expressed your judgments on the earth. Now, why would God give him a work to do if he and the Father were one on your fingers? Verse 5, And now, O Father, glorify thou me with thine own self, and dox abzo now me. May your opinion, your values, your judgments magnify themselves in me with thine own self, with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. I have manifested thy name unto the, uh, 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 thy name unto, unto the men which thou gavest me out of the world. Thine they are, and thou gavest them to me, and they have kept thy word. Now, Notice here that he does not say that we have uh, that, that, that uh, they have kept my word, but they have kept thy word. So Jesus is saying, they have kept your word, the same word you gave me to keep. Showing that God is the word. And it is his word that Jesus came and spoke to them, not his own word. Verse 7. Now they have known that all things whatsoever thou hast given to me are of thee. For I have given them uh, I have given unto them the words which thou gavest me, and they have received them, and they have known surely that I came out from thee, and they have believed that thou didst send me. Now, if you believe that Jesus and God are one like your fingers one, or if you believe that the Son of God is actually his own Father, then you cannot believe that God sent him, then surely you have not received the words which Jesus gave us, which words were also given to Jesus by his Father. Okay, verse 9. I pray for them. I pray not for them, and not for the world, but for them which thou hast given me, for they are thine. And all mine are thine, and thine are mine, and I am glorified in them. And now I am, in, I am no more in the world, but these are in the world, and I come to thee, Holy Father. Keep through thine own name those whom thou hast given me, that they may be one as we are one. Remember, he came in his Father's name. That's the name. Now, again we see here that Jesus is asking the Father to make us one with the Father in the same manner as he and the Father are one. So if you are not a hypocrite, then you must believe that God has made us one with himself in the same manner as he made himself and his son Jesus one. And if you believe it in any other way, you're not confessing the same thing that Jesus confessed. Verse 12. While I was with them in the world, I kept them in thy name. Those that thou gavest me I have kept, and none of them is lost but the son of perdition, that the scripture might be fulfilled. And now come I to thee, and these things I speak in the world, that they might have my joy fulfilled in them. I have given them thy word, and the world hath hated them, because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world, but that thou shouldest keep them from evil. They are not of the, the world, even as I am not of the world. Sanctify them through thy truth, for thy word is truth. Therefore he is saying here that the word is what sanctifies the believer. Now verse 18. As thou hast sent me into the world, even so have I sent them into the world. And for their sakes I, sent, I sanctify myself, that they also might be sanctified through the truth. Remember that word is truth. Remember that? So the word of God is what sanctifies us. And then he says, Neither pray after these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word. Now that's you and me, who have believed the word of God that was written for our admonition. Now, here's where we get to in closing. Now here is the gist of what the confession is all about. It is entering into the same mindset that we might become one with the Father or, or one with the same mindset as the Father. Now this is what Jesus petitions the Father in verse 21. That they all might be one. 
as the word, and, and remember, and, and the word as, it means in the same manner or in, the, in, or in like manner. So he says, that they might be one as you and I are one. In the same manner, see? As thou, Father, art of me and I in thee, that they also may be one in us, that the, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. Now notice the context of the prayers that God may grant to us oneness as he did with his son, and in the very same manner as he did with his son. And the next verse tells us how this is made possible. And notice the purpose is that the world may believe. So you see, if, if people can see Christ in you, that's the only thing that's going to draw them. If they're drawn because of a social program, forget it, they're not even born again. And how can they be born again to people that aren't born again? You understand what I'm saying? If people are born to a church program, they're, they're, they're born to something that's not born again because God doesn't birth church programs. I'm sorry, He births sons and daughters. So when the people see Jesus Christ is saying, yesterday, today, and forever in you, that's what draws them. That's what drew us to this message. Verse 22, And the glory, the doxa, the opinion, values, and judgment, which thou gavest me, I have given them, that they may also be one, even as we are one. Notice that what makes us one? It's the same doxa. It's the same judgment. It's the same opinions. It's the same values. That's what makes us one. Now I want you to pay close attention to the words that Jesus uses here because he says, The glory which thou gave me, I have given them. Okay? So there is something about this glory that we should know about because the same glory that God gave to him, he has given to us. And, 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 uh, and, and that is where we receive our glory. Now, notice he continues that they may be one, even as we are one. So it is this glory, it is this judgment, opinion, values that makes us one with God, even in the same way that Jesus and God were one. <clears throat> All right. So we see that, uh, that this is the glory that was given to Jesus from God, that made him one with God. And in the same manner, he has given us this glory, that we might also be one with God and, and one with him. And the glory which thou gave me, I have given them, that they may be one, even as we are one. Therefore, in order to make the same confession, or to say the same thing, we must know what this glory is, that we, are, that we all share together, having received it from Jesus, and, 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 and he from his own Father, God. And once we know what this glory is, then we shall also be able to see how it is that we become one with God, even as the Son of God himself was one. And as I mentioned, the Greek word there, for that word glory, is, is the word doxa, which means the opinion, judgment, and assessment. And the word assessment means the judgment of the value. Therefore, if we are to receive the same opinion Jesus has, and he received the same opinion God had, this is what makes us one. Thus we receive not only the same opinion, but the same judgment, and the same assessment of our values that God possesses, and the same values, opinions, and judgment that he gave to his son, and Jesus here, in his prayer, tells the Father that he has passed these things along to us, that we might also become one with the Father, even as he and the Father were one. Thus the very mind of God coming to the believer makes us one with the Father in the same way that Jesus was one with the Father. There's your image. It's not a beard. It's not nail scarred hand, it's not a robe, it's not, you know, all the, all the, it's not a facade. It's a reality. From the sermon of harvest time, Brother Branham said, Jesus said, that they might be one father as you and I are one. Not for some man to be over something, it never will work. One denomination wants to take over the other, and, 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 and one man over the other, but that you might be one with God, like Christ and God was one. That's what the prayer is. Uh, that that he, was, he was the Word, and Jesus prayed that he might be the Word reflecting him. That's his prayer to be answered. See how Satan scruples that up in the carnal mind? But what that wasn't Jesus' prayer at all, that, that we all might congregate together and all have a certain creed and so forth. Well, that's what they've done. As long as you believe their creed, you're one. No, you're not. There's got to be an expression in the body, an expression in the life. That wasn't Jesus' prayer at all. That we might all congregate together and have a certain creed and so forth. Every time they do that, they get further and further away from God. He wants us to be one with God, and God is the Word. Each individual in his heart must become that one with God. <clears throat> so we see here that Brother Adam's own words, that the oneness that Jesus had with the Father, and that he prayed that he would have, uh, uh, that we would have, is that we might be one with the Word, even as Jesus was one with God's Word. Not He's not talking creed now. He's not talking, uh, you know, your, your creed or your, 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 your dogma. He's talking, and I hate to say the word doctrine, but you know, people have made the doctrine a creed. It's not a creed. It's not what you can think and what you can say. It, it's, it, the, Christ is the doctrine. 
and he's also a life. You see? And that is how God will come into us when we say the same things, do the same things, live the same way, when our confession is his confession, when our thoughts are his thoughts. That this mind being here that was in Christ Jesus. What more can a man ask uh, of his wife than to have the same mindset concerning the family and raising the children? What greater oneness uh, than to share the same values, opinions, and judgments with your children and your children with you? And what more could a father ask of his children than uh, for them to share his values and his opinions and his judgments? That's what Jesus prayed for. And from the message gifts, Brother Brown said, now notice closely, now God dwelling in Christ used his voice to speak, but Jesus said in his miracle, uh, very early I say unto you, the Son can do nothing in himself, but what he sees the Father doing, that do the Son likewise. Is that right? St. John 5, 19. Then he did nothing within himself. No prophet ever did anything within himself until God showed him what to do. What a mistake Moses made when he went out without a vision of God and he smoked the Egyptian, thought he'd liberate them with his hand because he thought he had a lot of faith and could do it because he was called for the job. No matter how much you're called for the job, God has to do the leading. See, he failed. Of all of his schooling, all of his military mind, and his training as a great Egyptian leader, but yet it failed because God had a program and we've got to work according to God's program. No matter what we do, how smart we are, we've got to humble ourselves and work according to God's program. Amen. So he failed and God had to keep him another 40 years to educate, re-educate him. So what it, what it was, that he must forget himself and it's not him, but it was God. In other words, his brother Graham quoted Paul, he said, he said, uh, I, I, I am crucified with Christ. Not I was. Not 2,000 years ago, I was once for all crucified with Christ. I am daily crucified with Christ. And Brother Anderson Paul had to crucify himself daily. How much more you and I? And why do you think we have to wait almost 40 years since God took home his prophet? In fact, more than 40 now. It's probably, what, 47 years since God took home his prophet. He's waiting for us to get ourselves out of the way that God might have a preeminence and that we might think God's thoughts and do His actions and speak only His words. That's what He's waiting for, and adoption cannot come until the Son has the mind of the Father. And from the sermon, show us the Father, and it will satisfy Brother Adam says, the, uh, the works that I do shall you do also. And seeing the same results by human beings so submitted to God, until the Holy Spirit can work through those human beings just like the Holy Spirit worked through Jesus, who just has confessed that, I and my Father are one, my Father dwelleth in me, my uh, he doeth the works. It's not my, my words. It's, it's his words. See, he was so submitted. And from the sermon on bailing of God, Brother Brandon said, Jesus once said, when you see me, you see the Father. See, God and his word is one. Now you understand, when the word is manifested, what is it? Right. Well, see, uh, Jesus said, search the scriptures. You think that you, you, have, you believe in God, believe also in me. If I do not the works of my Father, then don't believe me. But if I do the works, then I and my Father are one. And when you see me, you have seen the, the Father. And when you see the Word made manifest, and see the Father God, because the Word is the Father, and the Word is God, and the Word was made manifest is God Himself taking His own Word and manifesting it among believers, plural. Nothing can make it live but believers, just believers. So we have a message that's kind of gone to the dogs. Because it got very heady, high-minded. It got to the place where they, you know, it's actually coming back full circle. At first they had the cart before the horse, they're trying to produce the works without having the mind of God. Now we come to the doctrine, we come to the understanding, we come to a correct understanding, we have the mind of God. Now the works must come, but you can't produce them. The only thing that will produce them is God himself, but God is looking for a people to work through. That's it. When we're there, it's adoption time. When the said that, that unless you're the right kind of a son, you won't be adopted. So it's about time that we simply die to self and allow Christ to live. His Father is a very gracious Father. We're thankful for your word. We pray, Father, you help us, Lord, to just let go and let God. Paul said, I, I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I'm living, yet it's not I that's living, but it's Christ actually living in me. And if the life that raised up Jesus from the dead dwells in you, it shall also quicken your mortal body, these bodies that are mortal, that are capable of dying. So Father, we just pray that, Lord, you help Brian to die to Brian, you help the rest of us to die to self, and help us, Father, just to be a living epistle written and known of all men, for we ask you humbly. In Jesus Christ's name.
and I'm missing that song, I know whom I have believed, and am persuaded that he is able. 